Hello everyone, I'd like to talk with you for a few minutes tonight about Judaism and in particular Rabbinic Judaism. We often speak of religions as if they came in only one version. We use terms like Judaism, a term I just used a moment ago, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism. We use single, simple terms as if these religions were single, simple things, as if they came in only one version. Honestly, I think that for many contexts, many purposes, this is perfectly fine. We don't always need to get into all of the complexities of these subjects. We don't always have the time. Those, in those situations, it's fine, right? However, there are circumstances where it is useful, if not necessary, to dig a little deeper into the complexities of these religious traditions. I'd like to dig a little deeper into the complexities of Judaism this evening. So here we are. Again, we often speak of these religions as if they came in only one version. I think a lot of us know that isn't really quite true. We could look, for example, at Christianity just in the United States. In the United States, what do we see? We see a number of traditions within Christianity represented. The two main ones in terms of numbers are Catholicism and Protestantism. We refer to their followers as Catholics and Protestants. Some of you may never even have heard these terms. If so, it's okay. Don't worry. You're in the class. That's why you're here. You'll learn plenty about it later. Some of us may be very familiar with these terms. Others may be only somewhat familiar with them. We might say, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I recognize those, uh, but we, we may not really know what unites them or divides them. We might say, well, I get they all got to be Christian because uh, when we refer to them that way, they have to have something in common then in virtue of that. And I, I guess they have to have some major differences or we wouldn't have the different names for them beyond that. You may not really be sure. And again, we'll study it more later this um the semester. Islam. Two main traditions of Islam in America um, in terms of numbers. Sunnism and Shiism, we refer to the followers as Sunnis and Shis. Some of you may know that this goes, you know, it goes for America, it goes for the world of Islam, you know, viewed globally. If we look at the whole world of Islam, we see that uh, the two main traditions in terms of numbers are Sunnism and Shiism. There are other traditions as well around the Islamic world. There are other traditions here in the United States. There are other traditions right here in DuPage County. Some of you may be familiar with many of these. Some of you may not have heard of any of them. Some of you may be saying right now, oh goodness, I've never even heard of Sunnism or Shiism. And again, it's fine. You're in the class. That's why you're here. You'll learn more about it later. No big deal. Let's look at Judaism. And in particular, modern Judaism, modern Judaism. We may be curious about the denominations and divisions, major denominations and divisions within modern Judaism. Now, I want to pause right here for a moment and note that terms like denomination and division don't necessarily have the exact same meaning. To my ear, they don't. When I hear denomination, I think of something that has some kind of formal organization, formal structure, some official leadership at the top of some kind. When I think of division, I don't think of that at all. Maybe it's there, maybe it's not. And this stuff can really come in degrees, right? But so for me, maybe every denomination is a division, but not every division is a denomination. I don't want us to get too into the weeds on this. If that distinction seems a bit, um, you know, unclear, it's not terribly important for us, honestly, at least in this context. You can you know, read about it um, online. I'm sure you can find some good resources on it. I'll say a little bit more about it tonight, but only a little. And again, I don't want us to get too into the weeds on, uh, into it. So what are the main, the major uh, denominations, divisions within modern Judaism? I'll mention three. There are more. I'll mention three. These three come up the most often in textbooks and other forms of scholarship on Judaism. So we have Reformed Judaism conservative Judaism, and orthodox Judaism. And actually, I do want to say a little bit about how we might apply the denomination division terms here. I definitely would not think, I would not speak of orthodox Judaism as a denomination. It, 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 there's, a, there's lots of orthodox Jews. There's lots of variety within orthodox Judaism, um, diversity within orthodox Judaism. There's, a, there's no real... Um, 
formal structure, organization, official leadership that, that unites them all, that binds them all. I, I would not think of it as a denomination in, 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 um, in that sense. The, the, the term denomination is going to make more sense and apply to Reformed and Conservative Judaism, though it could even be a little bit um, complicated applying it over there. You could go online, read about organization of Reformed Judaism, Conservative Judaism for more information on that. Um, just a few other comments I'll make. Reform Judaism and Conservative Judaism have fairly large representation in the United States, but I don't. My sense is they don't really have necessarily a whole lot of representation in Israel or England or other parts of the um, the Jewish world. Really quickly on Orthodox Judaism, it's common to um, divide that up in uh, into uh, what is sometimes called modern Judaism and ultra-Orthodox Judaism. Some Jews prefer different terms for for different reasons, and then you could, you could go on to make further divisions within those. I don't really want to worry too much about um, these things tonight. I don't want to really talk um, at all about what distinguishes Reformed, Conservative, and Orthodox Jews. I will talk about that in my next video on Jewish law, but I, I don't want to talk about what divides them, what distinguishes them tonight. I do want to talk about what unites them. And in particular, I, I, want, to, I want to talk about this concept of rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism. Because as it turns out, almost all Judaism today, almost all modern Judaism is Rabbinic Judaism. It's Rabbinic Judaism. Some textbooks give the impression that all modern Judaism is Rabbinic Judaism. Well, almost all, but not quite all. Not quite 100%. It's like 99.9998%. Right? So almost all modern Judaism is Rabbinic Judaism today. It has not always been so. If you were to get in a time machine and go back a thousand years and talk to Jews a thousand years ago, you would see a lot of these Jews do fall under what we would understand to be rabbinic Judaism, but many don't. Many do not. So to understand Judaism as a whole, the phenomenon of Judaism, the history of Judaism, modern Judaism, history of Judaism, uh, we really need to understand something about rabbinic Judaism. And to do that, we could start with this term, the term rabbinic itself, rabbinic. Let's spell it. R-A-B-B-I-N-I-C, rabbinic. Derives from this Hebrew term, rabbi. I believe the meaning of it is my master. It's an old term. It's been used by Jews for a long, long time. Uh, Jesus is called um, something like rabbi in the Aramaic language in the Christian New Testament. The term is old, 2,000 years old at least. It's been used in different ways over uh, the course of Jewish history. How is it, well, how is it used uh, today? How, and is that meaning tie into rabbinic Judaism at all or, or what? Well, yeah, th there is a, a common meaning of it today, and, and it is related to, to this term rabbinic Judaism. Let's, let's start with um, the most common meaning of the, of the word rabbi today. It can be defined in a few different ways, but um, they're more or less equivalent. We could we could start with this. We could start with the rabbi as a Jewish individual. As far as I know, they're all Jewish. I can't even imagine a non-Jewish rabbi. Um, I mean, it's 2022, but I can't imagine a non-Jewish rabbi. So it's a Jewish individual. In, in some traditions, they can only be men, and some they can be women. So we'll say a Jewish man or woman. We could say has studied Judaism uh, for a number of years, perhaps received a formal degree. I think typically today, you know, receive some kind of formal degree uh, from a special school, right? Uh, They're often called yeshivas. You know, you, you can go off to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Berkeley, Stanford, whatever, and get a degree in Jewish studies. It doesn't make you a rabbi. The school matters. It's not just studying about Judaism. And it's not, it's not even just about like what topics within Jewish studies you study, but how you study them, how you approach them, right? And this goes for other religions as well. I mean, just because you get a degree in, I don't know, um, Bible or something like that doesn't necessarily mean you're a priest or a pastor, right? Or, I mean, you could get a degree in Islamic studies or Quranic studies from all sorts of universities around the world. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be viewed as some sort of um, religious figure, you know, with, with some kind of authority or standing um, by practicing Muslims, right? So this, this is how it goes. It's not just what you're studying in a general sense, but the particulars of it and, and, and how you're doing it in the context in which you're doing it, right? So let's go back to this. 
rabbi, Jewish man, woman, studying Judaism for years, perhaps getting a formal degree from a, a special school, often called a yeshiva. Okay. Well, can, can we say more about that? You know, like, you know, what, about their stuff? Yeah. So the way that Michael Fishbane, Michael Fishbane is uh, a Jewish scholar at the University of Chicago. I, I believe he, he teaches Judaism and Bible there and um, rabbinic, rabbinic Judaism and Bible there. He's a really, really amazing scholar, written a lot of wonderful books on Judaism and the Bible. And he has an introductory book on, um, on Judaism. I have it right here, actually, in front of me. This is Michael Fishbane's book, Judaism. I, I think there's some kind of subtitle to it, which I can't see from the, the cover. But anyhow, actually, let's just read. How does, he, how does he do it? Rabbi, Hebrew term. My master, an authorized teacher of the Jewish tradition, an authorized teacher, schooling, right? Recognized schooling. The role of the rabbi has changed considerably throughout the centuries. Okay, we saw that. Traditionally, rabbis serve as the legal and spiritual guides of their congregations and communities. It goes on to say, title is conferred after considerable study of Jewish sources. The conferral and its responsibilities is central to the chain of tradition in Judaism. Okay, let's focus on this. Legal and spiritual guides, legal and spiritual guides. That might sound a little interesting to us. Um, it, you know, if you come from a Christian background, you, you might not, you know, think of your pastor, if you're, let's say if you're a Protestant, you might not think of your pastor as a, as a legal authority. You might say, well, that's a lawyer, right? Um, so to really understand, uh, but if you come from a Jewish background or an Islamic background, this makes sense, right? Yeah, legal authority, spiritual authority and legal authority. Um, so to really understand this, to unpack this, we're going to have to talk a bit about Jewish law. We're going to have to talk about Jewish law. Okay. Before we get to law, let's go back for a moment. Legal authority, spiritual authority. What do we mean here? We mean somebody that Jews, religious Jews, would recognize as having authority, as being able to speak to them, to give them advice about uh, Jewish law, Jewish spirituality, Jewish belief, right? Rabbis study Jewish law. They study um, Jewish texts for that, for, for, where a lot of that law is found. They study Jewish law. They study Jewish texts. They study Jewish theology. Um, they study Jewish spirituality. They study Jewish worship. They, of, they, uh, they often um, participate or even officiate in worship services or parts of worship services in synagogues, Jewish houses of worship, right? That's what a rabbi is. They're, they're, they're scholars, um, they're worship leaders. They're um, at least many times they're worship leaders. They're uh, spiritual advisors. They they do all they they do all of this. Um, they're they're experts in Jewish prayer. They're experts in the interpretation of Jewish texts. Again, Jewish law, Jewish theology, all of this, right? Through many many years of intense study. How does this relate to rabbinic? Well, rabbinic is referring to this tradition of rabbis that Fishbane's definition um, alluded to. Rabbinic is referring to a chain of teachers, a tradition it can, it, that involves a chain of, of teachers, a chain of rabbis. One generation training the next, training the next, training the next. And not just training them in any, in any old thing, but in Judaism, and not just in any old way, but centering on specific text. Now, not all of this is concerned with law, what we would call law, but a lot of it is. And so to get more into this, we need to say a little bit, um, we need to say a little bit about Jewish texts and a little bit about Jewish law. There's so much that could be said about Jewish law. I'm going to make a whole other video on it. I'm going to make a whole other video on it. So um, let me try to keep it as simple as possible, keep this video as short as possible. And let, let's, let's start with this. Um, you know, another complexity we have to deal with here is, is as follows. There's complexity in how we refer to a certain book or a certain set of books. Maybe the best way to start, start off with, with this. As many of you know, um, the central holy text of Christianity is the Bible. Many divisions within Christianity, the Bibles are only, um, holy text. For others, it's more complicated than that. I'm not going to worry about that right now. But we'll, we'll just start with the simple fact that obviously the, the Bible's essential religious text in Christianity. Now, if you look at the Christian Bible, 
Christians divide the Bible into two main parts. And they could divide each of these parts into further parts they do. We don't have to worry about that right now. They divide the Bible into two main parts called by them the Old Testament and the New Testament. Christians have used these terms for a long time. Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament. Right? Um, and so there, there it goes. There it goes. Now, um, I could actually mention quickly that not all Christians have the exact same Old Testament. They do have the exact same New Testament, not quite the exact same Old Testament. We're not going to worry about the different versions of the Old Testament right now. We won't, won't, won't worry about that. Um, we'll just talk really simply about Old Testament, New Testament. Now, a lot of us, if we weren't raised in Judaism, we haven't studied Judaism, and someone were to ask us, okay, so Christians have the Bible, what do Jews have? Like, what are the sacred texts of Judaism? And a lot of us might say, geez, I don't know. I don't know any about them. I, I don't know anything about it. I can't name a single one. Others would say they have one and only one sacred text. The Old Testament that the Christians share, more or less. Again, there's different versions here. We're not going to worry about that. Um, they share most of the books in common. That's all I'm going to say about it from here on out. So some of us would say, I just don't know. I don't know what books you know are sacred to the Jews. Others would say it's the Old Testament, only the Old Testament. Well, actually, it's a lot more complicated than that. In rabbinic Judaism, there are a lot of books that are viewed as authoritative in addition to the Old Testament. Another complication here, many of you may know, many Jews do not, well, really, I don't know any Jew who's ever used the term uh, Old Testament. Some, some Jews even find the term offensive. A lot of scholars would like to avoid it for that reason. We, the term Old Testament is so old, it's so entrenched that, uh, that a lot of scholars actually find it kind of um, impossible to avoid, and so they just use it. And, um, you know, actually, I say, I, I don't think I've ever personally heard a Jewish individual uh, use the term Old Testament, but I, I've known Jewish scholars who do, who will use that term. Um, there are other terms that can be used. Sometimes scholars use the term Hebrew Bible for the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, because most of it's written in Hebrew. The problem is some of it is written in Aramaic, so it's not all written in Hebrew. Um, sometimes scholars, and I've known some Jews just refer to it as the Jewish Bible. I've heard Jews just refer to it as the Bible. There are other terms in Judaism. To keep things simple, just not to confuse ourselves, because um, a lot of us are not coming from a Jewish background, we're just going to stick with the term Old Testament. We're just going to call it the Old Testament. And again, some of us are under the impression it's the only authoritative text, the only kind of sacred text there is in Judaism. Again, if that's what you're thinking right now, no problem. You're in a class. That's why you're here. But the, the reality is more complicated, and it depends on what kind of Judaism we're talking about. But if we, if we talk about rabbinic Judaism, there's way more text in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is, in, in many ways, it's the foundation, especially the first part of it, the Torah. But it's there's so much. There's so much in addition to it. There's so much in addition to it. There's a lot of books of the Old Testament. I don't want to start naming them off. You can read about that in the assigned readings and read about it online. I can give you all kinds of resources on it. I just want to say quickly that if you open the Old Testament and you start reading it through, you encounter lots of different materials, lots of different materials, lots of different materials. There's lots of historical narrative, right? There are um, prophecies. There are prayers. Uh, there's all sorts of material in there. There's genealogies. There's all sorts of different material in there. Um, one type of material that we have is a legal material, law. And now a lot of us, we think, oh, no way, I, I get it. Old Testament law, Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments. Well, kind of, yeah, right? Like, that's part of it. Um, some of us may think that the, the, you know, Jewish law, the Old Testament law, consists in Ten Commandments and nothing but the Ten Commandments. And that's, that's not quite right, actually. Jewish tradition actually speaks of 613 mitzvot, 613 commandments in the Torah, the first books of the Old Testament, the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It, you actually probably should look that up and know it, all right? Um, Jewish tradition talks about, uh, rabbinic tradition talks about 613 mitzvot, not 10 commandments. Well, 10 sayings is actually part of it, right? Um 
actually technically the way that Jews often think of it, the first one of those commandments is not really a commandment, it's more of a saying, but we don't have to really, um, yeah, let's not worry about that. Um, 10 commandments is only 10. You pick up the Old Testament, read the first couple books of the Old Testament, you're going to run into a lot more than 10 commandments, a lot more than 10 commandments. Um, you know, just to go into a little more detail on this, for those who are really interested, the Ten Commandments appear for the first time in the book of Exodus, which is the second book of the Old Testament. They appear in Exodus chapter 20. Before then, before Exodus 20, God's already given various laws to Israel and in a way to the whole human race. And after the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, there are many more laws, hundreds of more laws given, hundreds of more, of more laws given. Jewish tradition, 613 mitzvot commandments in the Torah, these first five books of the Old Testament, right? And actually, if you read the book of Exodus, you see the Ten Commandments have to be given twice because they're originally written on these tablets that are that, that Moses has possession of. And then Moses comes down Mount Sinai and sees the worship of the golden calf and slams down the tablets and they get broken. And then God has to rewrite them. And I think that's in Exodus chapter 34. And then if you look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and Exodus 34, they're actually not the exact same list. And that's really interesting. And yeah, we're kind of, we're getting into the weeds a little bit here. So I'll just mention one more thing about the Ten Commandments and stop. If you were actually to take Exodus 20, and you were told to find the Ten Commandments, your list might not agree with everybody else's list. And you might have a little bit of a hard time deciding on how exactly to number them. And different Christian groups actually number them in different ways, right? I think some of the groups agree with the Jewish numbering, but, um, you know, anyhow, it's, 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 a, it's a little bit of complexity there. I'm not trying to deny at all the importance of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. They're extremely important. They're extremely important in the Old Testament, in Judaism, and uh, to Christians. They're extremely important. My only point, they're not the only laws in the Old Testament, not even in the Torah, not even in the first five books of the Old Testament. Again, Jewish tradition, 613 laws. Okay, 613 laws. Now, if you're a Jew, you might want to take those laws pretty seriously if you thought God gave you those laws. The status of these laws gets a bit complicated in Christianity. Let's not worry about that right now. We're in a Judaism unit. But the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible, presents these laws as being handed down by God. The idea then is they should be taken pretty seriously. Right? A lot more could be said about that, but they should be taken pretty seriously. Okay, great. Go take them seriously. Why not take them seriously? Well, one issue here is that the laws are not always easy to understand. You may be aware that in every religion, there's always disputes about religious texts. I'm not saying that everything's disputed. I, I think some things are pretty clear in these texts, and you don't you don't really get a whole lot of argument about some of the you know some passages. Um, but other passages engender a lot of uh, debate. They give rise to a lot of debate, a lot of discussion. Interpretation is not always clear. Um, you might be aware with legal systems in uh, in the United States around the world. You know, we have, uh, you know, um, appellate court, Supreme Court. You know, we have disputes about how to interpret the Constitution and these things. It happens with the New Testament. It happens with the Quran. It happens with other Islamic texts. It happens with Hindu texts. It happens with the Old Testament. So some of the laws are, they're a bit tricky to interpret. So for example, you may be aware one of the Ten Commandments is honor the Sabbath. Observe the Sabbath. Well, how do we do that? What is the Sabbath? It's the last day of the week, right? It's the last day of the week. By the way, in the United States, we typically start the day on Sunday and end it on Saturday. It's Saturday, the seventh day. Sunday is the first day of the week. Saturday is the last day of the week. The Sabbath is Saturday, it actually starts on Friday evening. It goes from Friday evening to Saturday evening because an old Jewish way of thinking about things, the day actually begins in the evening. So it's like it's Saturday, but that's Friday evening to Saturday evening, the seventh day of the week, the last day of the week, if you start the week on Sunday. Right? The, the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, it tells us God rested on the Sabbath. He created the world and he rested. Right? The Bible says, God rests, you rest. There's some other reasons given for Sabbath observance in the Old Testament as well. So you're, so part of the Sabbath, at least part of it, 
is there supposed to rest? Well, what does that mean? Does that mean we all have to like lay out in hammocks? Does that, you know, uh, what, 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 is, what does rest mean? Well, don't work. Well, what constitutes work? That can be tricky. And by the way, what if I'm a doctor? What if you're a doctor? What if somebody's life is on the line? Do we have to let them die because we're not allowed to work on the Sabbath? Well, rabbinic Judaism would say no, save life, right? I mean, when, when you when you have religions um, with rich legal systems like this, um, which you have, for example, in Judaism and Islam, you, you make exceptions, you know, typically for life and health, right? You, you don't require like pregnant women to fast during Ramadan in Islam, that could harm the woman. It could harm the. It could harm the fetus. You don't do that. She can have an exemption. Maybe she can make it up later, right? Um, rabbinic tradition says no. If you're a doctor, you, you, you know, and a patient's severely injured and and they're going to die if they don't get help, and it's the Sabbath to help them. Here's the thing, though. The Old Testament doesn't actually give us a lot of guidance about that. It says, don't, don't work. It doesn't give us a lot of guidance as to what constitutes work. So that's an issue right there. And there's a lot of other laws in the Old Testament that can be really complicated to interpret. They can be really, really complicated to apply. The Old Testament also says that Jews should um, make their sacrifices at the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. Well, that temple doesn't exist anymore. There were two. One was destroyed by the Neo-Babylonians and the other was destroyed by the Romans. The Romans destroyed the second temple. It was about the year 70 CE, so not quite 2,000 years ago. Well, if the Old Testament says that Jews should present their sacrifices in the temple and then the temple gets destroyed, what do you do? There's a lot of complications like this um, that arise in the law. Sometimes the law is just unclear. It's uncertain. Sometimes it might be fairly clear in a way, but then you could have some kind of historical development that makes it kind of impossible to follow, at least the way you used to follow it. You know, going back to the Sabbath again, um, there's some passages in the Old Testament that seem to make pretty clear that one thing you should not do on the Sabbath is kindle fire. Um, at least if, uh, if you're doing cooking, you're not supposed to cook on the Sabbath. Okay, so we don't kindle fire, at least for the purposes of cooking. Maybe we just don't kindle fire at all, right? We don't do that. We don't kindle fire. We don't start fires. Well, what happens when electricity comes around? What do you do about that, right? Does flipping a light switch count as kindling a fire? Yes or no? And some people at this point would say, you know what? I, you know, I don't think this stuff really matters. And I mean, we all have to, you have to all make up your own mind on that. I, but I do want to give you a bit of the perspective, you know, and actually even within Judaism, there's some different views on this. I mean, I've known Jews who would take these laws very, very seriously, and I know Jews that don't take it very seriously. And I could say the same for Christians and Muslims and all the rest. And some, some people in these religions think that some laws are obviously more important than others and all the rest. But many Jews would take this stuff pretty, pretty seriously. And why? Because the laws come from God. And God makes very clear in the Old Testament that he takes the Sabbath very, very, very seriously. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very important part of Jewish tradition. A lot of Jews really want to, they want to do it right. Right? They want to have answers to this. Um, I'll mention another example. I'm looking at the time when this video is going a little longer than I thought, so hopefully I'll end it within... Uh, you know, maybe five minutes or so. I'll just mention another example really quickly. There's a passage that comes up twice in uh, the Torah. It's in Deuteronomy, and I can't remember if the other occurrence is in Leviticus or Exodus. I think it's in Exodus. I might be wrong. Maybe it's in Leviticus. But there's a line in um, uh, the Torah gets repeated that basically says, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. What do we mean by a kid here? We're not talking about a human child. We mean a baby goat. You're not allowed to take a baby goat and boil it in its mother's milk. 
And that, that's been puzzling for some juice. Some juice has said, well, wait a, wait a second. Can I boil like a calf in its mother's milk? Like out of all the other, you know, like mammals that we eat, uh, can we boil all of those, you know, offspring in the mother's milk or does this only apply to goats? And is it, is it, is it only apply to boiling or what about other types of, of preparation? And, and, and it, it was kind of confusing. And some some Jews said, well, all it says is don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. So so that that's it. Anything else goes. And other Jews said, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe we should be a little more cautious. Maybe we should build a fence around the Torah. We should we should make sure we don't even come with intensity blocks of violating this law. And so let's let's review. The Old Testament contains a lot of law. The law is issued by God. It is it, 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 it is it is very important to follow in the Old Testament for various reasons. Very important. I'll talk a little more about that in the next video. Actually, like you know, why do you follow these laws? Is it is it a sin if you don't follow all these laws? Are you guaranteed a blessing? You know, uh, does anything have to do with a personal relationship with God? We'll get into that in the next video. Let's let's just review this. Old Testament, very important. Foundational. The view is some sense or other, it's in, it comes from God. A lot of laws in these texts that come from God. You want to follow them for various reasons, but the laws aren't always clear. Well, what do you do? Well, now, I mean, in the United States, we can go up to the Supreme Court. Well, what do you, what do, you do here? What do you do? And some Jews said, well, these books are the only books we've got. They're the only books we've got. For various reasons, we're not going to get into, um, you know, the whole Old Testament actually probably isn't canonized all of it fully until after the death of Jesus. You know, some of it, like the Torah, the first five books seem to be pretty well agreed on, but some other parts of it are not maybe fully agreed on until after the death of Jesus. So, but, you know, you go through this process, this complex process of canonization, where Jews decide that these and only these books are the books that are going to be in what we call the Bible, the Jewish Bible, that Christians will call the Old Testament, whatever. And that's, there it is. Now, those books are very important for all Jews, believe in practicing Jews, right? But some Jews say, well, that's the, the, some Jews do say those are the only books we're going to follow, the only books we can recognize, the only books that are authoritative. Those are the ones that are written by prophets or, other, or, or say, prophets and sages and the only ones we can trust. These are not the rabbinic Jews. And then there's a group of folks that end up becoming the rabbis in this more specialized sense of rabbinic Judaism, not just any old teacher or any old master, but authorities within this tradition that we will call rabbinic Judaism, the rabbis of rabbinic Judaism, the teachers of, of rabbinic Judaism, the architects of rabbinic Judaism. And, and this is kind of what they do. They say, well, here's the thing. God gave us these books that are sacred and they're filled with these laws. If all we do is apply our intelligence we can't figure out how to follow all of them. And this stuff really matters. So I'm not saying that we find ancient texts that reason explicitly like I'm about to, but I, I think it's fair to attribute this kind of reasoning to a lot of the um, early rabbis of rabbinic Judaism. You might, you might almost think about it like this. If God gave us all these laws, he's got to give us some way to know how to follow them. If he's wise and good and serious and a good teacher, which he better be, he, he, he must have left us with some way to figure out how to follow him. Okay, then what is it? Well, it turns out there were these traditions, oral traditions, oral, not written down yet, past word of mouth. There were oral traditions that, that, you know, that for some time before Jesus, I'm not exactly sure for how long, but at least for some time before Jesus, had been circulating these oral traditions that would help do various things, help clarify some parts of the Bible that might not have to do much with law, supplement stories in the Bible, but also help to explain the law, how to follow the law. This is often called the oral Torah, like the, the, the oral law in contrast with the Jewish Bible, um, the written Torah. And again, the word Torah is sometimes applied to just Sometimes it's applied just to the first, oftentimes it's applied just to the first five books of the Old Testament where you have a lot of this law, Torah. 
a term that can mean law, instruction, um, teaching, and so forth, right? So there, there were, what I'm trying to get at is this, there were Jews, we don't, I mean, we don't have their names, right? Historians don't believe we have their names. They're lost to history. Jews before the time of Jesus who had, who had um, generated, preserved, handed, whatever, all sorts of traditions, oral traditions about how to interpret this law, apply this law. Um, that goes back again before the time of Jesus. We see rabbinic Judaism starting after the time of Jesus, after the time of Jesus. What we see, what, what rabbinic Judaism is, it's a movement that begins in a formal sense after Jesus, but it's stretching back to traditions from before the time of Jesus, before 2,000 years ago. And what it does is it takes those oral traditions and it, it studies them, it evaluates them, it, it weighs them, it sifts them. And it compiles them and comments on them. And let's t let's talk about some of the texts and in, 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 in which this is all this is all done. Um, so Jesus is born a little bit before the year zero. He dies about the year thirty. About the year two hundred and twenty CE. So if Jesus dies in thirty two twenty, it's not quite two hundred years after the death of Jesus, but close we could just say two hundred years after Jesus. About 200 years after the death of Jesus, a book appears, a book called the Mishnah. The Mishnah. It's um, edited by a man named Judah Hanasi. Judah Hanasi, I'll give you um, a sheet of key terms to understand all of this. Judah Hanasi edits this Mishnah. This Mishnah, edited by Judah Hanasi, contains oral traditions. They're now written, they're being written down. They go back, well, you know, before the time of Jesus. Okay. How long is this book, the Mishnah? Well, in English, the one translation I've I've really looked at, published by Oxford, I think it was in the sixties, it's about a thousand pages long. And I, I, my re my recollection is the print is fairly small. It's about a thousand pages long, and the Mishnah isn't a hundred percent about law, but a lot of it's about law, and it, it's trying to clarify that Old Testament law, um, in a, in in the light of present circumstances, right? And in many respects, it does it does a very it does a very good job, a very interesting job. But it's not always clear itself. Sometimes, in attempting to clarify things, it fails to clarify, or even generates new problems along the way, and it didn't address all the all the questions that you might have had. So the mission is not enough. So what do you do? Well, you keep studying the Old Testament. You study the Mishnah. You're still working with some surviving oral tradition. You got lots and lots of scholars, and eventually you produce new writings, kind of commentaries on the Mishnah. That so you produce these writings that incorporate not all, but big chunks of the Mishnah and parts of the Old Testament, some of which are incorporated into the Mishnah itself, and the judgments of the opinions of new scholars. And these are called Gemaras, Gemaras. Again, I'll give you a sheet with these names written down. I'll send you my Talmud notes that basically have all this in it, right? And so there's one Mishnah edited, uh, finished by Judah Hanasi in about 220 CE. There's two Gemaras, two Gemaras, the Palestinian and the Babylonian, the Palestinian land of Israel, completed by scholars in the land of Israel, right? The Babylonian completed in the land of Iraq, basically, by Jews who ended up in Iraq through a, a complex historical process I'm not going to get into right now. So you had one Mishnah, which is kind of putting down in paper and editing, expanding these oral traditions, the oral Torah. Then you get these commentaries on, on the Mishnah and the and continuation of this work of trying to understand the law of the Old Testament and the law of the Mishnah. Um, these Gemaras, but there's two Gemaras, the, ba the Palestinian and the Babylonian. The Palestinian is done about the year 450 CE, and the Babylonian is done about the year 600 CE, though I think there's some editing that goes on with both of them even after that. And you take, you take, the, you take um, basically that Gemara, which, you know, with the Mishnah, the parts of the Mishnah it's commenting on, and that gives you a Talmud. 
And so there's two Gemaras, there's two Talmuds. There's the Palestinian Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. We say the Palestinian was done in about the year 450 because that's when its Gemara was finished. And the Babylonian is done about um, the year 600 because that's when its Gemara was finished. And, if, and, and how long is the Babylonian Talmud? Oh man, thousands of pages, thousands of pages, thousands of pages. It could fill up multiple shelves, multiple shelves. Cost, um, I haven't looked at it on Amazon lately. There's a few different full English translations, not many, but a, full, a few. Um, I think they're usually at least $1,000, right? The Mishnah and the Gemara as a Talmud really are the foundational texts of rabbinic Judaism. We're coming up on a 40-minute mark. I want to wrap this up really soon. These are the foundational texts of rabbinic Judaism. These are not the only texts of rabbinic Judaism. There were other texts that were produced at the same time, that the, you know, about the time that the mission and Gemaras were being done. There have been many texts produced since. But this is what we're talking about when we talk about rabbinic Judaism. We're talking about the Judaism of the rabbis. Well, what in a specific sense? What the rabbis who taught these texts? Which texts? Texts like the Talmud and other texts. Are all these texts concerned even mainly with law? Not exactly, but a lot of them are, and that's what we're focused on right now. Um, it's a it's a very important part of it. It's a very important part of it. So um, that taught you know texts. The authority of these texts, including these legal texts, like the Talmud and other texts. Not all Jews accepted the authority of these texts. Many did. You go back about a thousand years ago, a lot of Jews saying, nope, we're not going to, no. They would say this, look, look. They might say, look, we respect you rabbis. You're, you're obviously great scholars. You're, you're obviously devout. You obviously care a lot about Israel. You obviously care a lot about God. But you're just men. The Bible, prophets, sages inspired by God, right? Divinely inspired. This stuff, no. No. It, it's interesting. Some of it we may want to take seriously, but no, we don't recognize it as authoritative on the whole. And the rabbis kind of, you know, they had various arguments to come back to that, but one we've already kind of touched on. Like, look, if God gave us this law, and he's wise and he's good and he's a good teacher, then shouldn't he have given us some way to know how to follow it? And where else could we find that outside of our tradition? The tradition itself is, an, an, is, is in a sense uh, a bearer, uh, an expression of divine revelation. God is guiding us to interpret these texts. Who else would he be guiding? If, if You know, if not, if not the Jews themselves, the scholars, Right? They could also say, look, do you agree that you should keep the Sabbath? Yeah, of course. Well, then how do you do it? The text doesn't tell you exactly how to do it. You got to be doing something. If you won't trust uh, the Talmud and these other texts and you won't trust anything else, then you're telling me you're only trusting your own brain, your own, your own tradition, which you are telling me you place no authority in. So you're actually totally contradicting yourself. Someone so far as to argue that actually the whole Talmud it had actually been revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai and the whole thing was passed down orally. Well, I don't know how many people would really accept that today. But the idea that the Talmud is rooted in the Old Testament and the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, the revelation that Moses got at Sinai, or he got the Ten Commandments, yeah, in some way, yeah. So, this is what we mean when we're talking about rabbinic Judaism. We're talking about a tradition in Judaism that sanctions certain texts, that regards certain texts as authoritative. There's a lot of them. For now, we're just looking at the two Talmuds, which are perhaps somewhat confusingly often referred to in the singular as the Talmud, largely because the Babylonian Talmud has historically been a lot more influential than the um, Palestinian. So that's it. That's what we mean by rabbinic Judaism. And rabbinic Judaism, even though it was contested, and even though a lot of people disagreed with it, it did eventually basically win. And you see that today in modern Judaism, these reform, conservative, orthodox, I guess I will say a little bit about what uh, distinguishes them, I have to. They, they end up being largely distinguished in terms of how, how much of... Uh, the Talmud and these other texts they follow, how much of its interpretation of the law they follow, how faithfully they follow it, um, kind of how traditionally they follow it. 
And some religions like Christianity within Protestantism, you know, you could have different denominations of Protestant that worship basically the exact same way, but they split over disagreements on theology. That does not happen in Judaism really so much. You can have people of very different beliefs that are Reformed Jews, Conservative Jews, Orthodox Jews, but there will be a lot of uniformity in the amount of the law that they follow and how they follow it. And the thing is, what they are taking as their standard is the Talmud and these other rabbinic texts. So you could you could talk to a lot of Jews today uh, that will say, I'm not really that observant. Well, what do they mean when they say they're not observant? They, they're saying they're not following a lot of the law. Is defined by who? The rabbis, the Talmud. They're letting the rabbis, they're letting the Talmud and these other rabbinic texts define what the standard is. So when they say I'm not that observant, they mean relative to that standard. That really shows the power of the rabbis. They could just say, I'm fully observant with whatever I think God really wants me to do. That's just what I'm doing. That's not what, no, that's not what they do. They say, they often say I'm not very observant because they're letting the Talmud set the standard. That's what we mean by rabbinic Judaism. Just a few other things to wrap up. Norman Solomon, who wrote Judaism, a very short introduction for Oxford, he notes that while we typically think of Judaism as a religion that's much older than Christianity, you know, I mean, according to the Old Testament, Moses and Abraham, if, if we regard these people as real, as historical, they would have lived over a thousand years before Jesus, right? And we think of them as Jews. So we think of Judaism as very, very old, way older than uh, Jesus. But rabbinic Judaism is rooted in the Mishnah and the Gemaras. These texts were put to paper after Jesus died. The Babylonian Talmud, like over 500 years after Jesus died, it was finished. In that sense, you might think of Judaism as younger than Christianity. But obviously, even then, the roots of it go well before the time of Jesus. So it's a bit of a complicated thing. Another thing I would say is I'd really encourage all of you to read the Talmud. Um, I, I really, I love reading the Talmud myself. I, I greatly, greatly enjoy it. Um, I think it's a fantastic text. There are, uh, you say, well, it's thousands of pages long and it's a thousand bucks. I'm not saying go like tackle the whole thing, though there are apps for that, seriously. Um, but there are some really nice abridged versions of it. Some of them are maybe about a thousand pages. That's still pretty long. Some are only 400 pages. That might still seem long. If you look on the Blackboard site for the class, I've taken just a handful of pages out of a few different editions, um, pages that I, I think really uh, bring out the power and the beauty of um, the Talmud. There is one uh, edition in particular, I, I think the title is Rabbinic Stories, edited by Rubenstein and Cohen, um, that I think has some really, really just, you know, wonderful um, and wonderfully engaging uh, stories uh, that you could read. I've taken out some of the legal material and I've included uh, a text called Tractate A Vote, which is a collection of wisdom literature from the Talmud, which um, you might really enjoy. So if you really want to understand uh, Judaism, uh, rabbinic Judaism, I think a good place to start is read the Talmud, go on YouTube, listen to lectures on it. All right. I hope you enjoyed uh, the discussion.